So in our previous screencast, we talked about our first periodic trend, that of atomic radius. Now we're going to talk about our second periodic trend, that of ionization energy. And the explanations as to why atomic radius scales the way that it does through the periodic table is actually a very similar explanation as to why we have a periodic trend in ionization energy. So the first thing we have to do is define exactly what ionization energy is. So it is by definition the energy needed to remove an electron from an atom. Now there are several different ionization energies for every atom. For each electron that you remove it's a different ionization energy. So for example the first ionization energy is how much energy it takes to remove the first electron. I know. Hard stuff. From a neutral atom. Now I say smallest IE here, meaning of all the ionization energies in, of any particular atom, the first ionization energy is always going to be the easiest. It's the delta E, so another way of looking at it is that it's the delta E of associated just taking some neutral compound and turning it into a plus one ion, plus one electron. Now the second ionization energy is defined as the energy required to take a positive one ion and turn it into a positive two ion. So it's not the second ionization energy is not how much energy it takes to remove two electrons, it's how much energy it takes to remove the second electron after you've already ditched the first. Now, again, we have this smallest ionization energy is the first one. Second ionization energies are always larger. And the reason is, is because in a similar reason, a similar rationale as to atomic radius, as we remove electrons, we, we still have the same number of protons, but the number of protons being constant were and by reducing the number of electrons by one, we essentially have fewer electrons for the protons to hang on to, so those remaining electrons are held a little bit tighter, drawn in a little bit closer, and held tighter. So the third ionization energy is always going to be bigger than the second ionization energy, and, vice, and by extension, fourth is bigger than third, and blah, blah, blah. So let us consider sodium and magnesium. The first ionization energies of them are 496 kilojoules per mole and 738 kilojoules per mole, respectively. So this makes sense as we go, so sodium and magnesium are right next to each other on the periodic table, and if we just make one step to the right, the ionization energy goes up by quite a bit, from, from 500 to almost 750. Which makes sense as we go left to right on our periodic table, the effective nuclear charge increases, and since the effective nuclear charge increases, that means that the amount of the positive charge in that nucleus, which is drawing those electrons in, keeping them tight, is greater. So for the same reason, the, the rationale, the why is the first ionization energy of magnesium greater than that of sodium, is pretty much the exact same explanation as to why magnesium is smaller than sodium. So you go from left to right across a row, the outermost electrons are in the same orbital, and they're drawn closer. Again, you cannot use this as an explanation that the reason why magnesium's first ionization energy is smaller is because it's to the right on the periodic table. That's the answer, that's not the reason. If we look top to bottom, so we need that scale. So potassium and rubidium, both in group 1A, we see that potassium has a larger first ionization energy than rubidium. This makes sense because we know that rubidium is a larger atom, so that means by definition its outermost electrons are farther out. If they're being if they're farther out, then it's easier to remove them. Again, there's a there's a a deep correlation between atomic radius and how tightly those outermost electrons are being held, and so the looser it's being held, the easier it is to remove. So the, ioniz the first ionization energy goes down as you go down on the periodic table. The size is going up, and the effective nuclear charge reduces that influence. So here's another way of looking at it. Here's the first ionization energy trend, um, sort of just color-coded, and these are in kilojoules per mole. And as you can see, as we go from left to right across a, a particular row, the ionization energy increases, and as we go bottom to top, the ionization energy increases, which makes sense. Now, we have these few hiccups every once in a while in the trends in the first ionization energy, and we have to account for them. So you'll notice that the tops of each one of these sort of hiccups represent group 8A, um, and that's not a huge surprise that the noble gases would have the highest first ionization energies because you're, you're essentially breaking a P6 
set of orbitals, nice and full. And then group 1a is right after those. Those have the lowest. That makes sense because those are the atoms, those are the largest atoms on the periodic table. And that that electron that you're removing in the first ionization energy, the electron that you're removing for the group 1a elements is that last electron that got tacked on after the noble gas configuration. So these elements all want to lose their first electron, so naturally their first ionization energy is going to be low. But then you need to look at these sort of hiccups here. We have a hiccup there, and we have a hiccup there, and a hiccup there, and a hiccup there, and a hiccup there. And we have to sort of explain what those hiccups are. So the easiest way to see those is to consider beryllium. So beryllium, as we can see, has a full 1s orbital and a full 2s orbital. So it's a total of four electrons, one, two, three, four. So that's right there. And the next element on the periodic table is boron. So boron has one electron in a 2p orbital, and that's right there. And notice its ionization energy went down, which means it's a little easier to remove that fifth electron. Well, it sort of makes sense in that we just put one electron in this 2p orbital that was empty just a moment ago. And so this one electron, it's a little bit easier to remove it and it is to hack into the 2s orbital here in beryllium. Now, so that explains why this one here is a little bit less, and the downward trend should be up and to the right. But what about this one? Well, this here at this peak represents nitrogen. So, and here's our electronic configuration of nitrogen, 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. And of course, we follow Hund's rule, so all three of the orbitals are half filled with the same, spit, the same spin. In this case, I just happen to make them spin up. And we learned before about electronic configuration that there's a stability in half-filled and completely filled sets of orbitals. And sure enough, we have a half-filled P set. And so it's a little bit more stable. And what that means by a little bit more stable is that it's a little bit harder to sort of break one of those electrons and remove it. So the ionization energy here of nitrogen is a little higher than what the sort of general trend would be. Now what about the next element, which is oxygen? its ionization energy is a little bit low than what the general trend says. And sure enough, we can see it here that with the oxygen, we sort of added one electron past that nice little half filling. So this one electron here is going to be a little bit easier to remove because if they remove that one electron, then it becomes isoelectronic, the same number of electrons as nitrogen. So that's why oxygen's ionization energy is a little bit lower. One last thing about ionization energies has to do with the relative magnitudes of the first, second, and third ionization energies. So we look at the first, second, and third ionization energies of the element magnesium. Removing the first electron cost me 738. Removing the second electron cost me an additional 1450 kilojoules, which makes sense because remember as we're removing electrons, the total number of electrons that atom needs to hang on to is less and less. But then we have this huge jump between losing the second electron and losing the third electron. The reason that is is because after we've sort of done this second ionization energy, magnesium is now had now has lost it's a plus two ion, and it has lost its two valence electrons. And so this next electron here is removing the first core electron. We're essentially hacking into a P6 set of orbitals and we know how much P6 sets of orbitals are stable. So put another way, that the ionization energy of the first core electron, because that's, that, that's what this represents, the 7700, which is a huge number, is how much energy it takes to remove that first core electron, which, you know, when we talk about chemical reactivity, we never even think about the core electrons because those are never shared. The example that I, I keep coming back to when, when we've talked about this and the difference between valence electrons and core electrons is, you know, the valence electrons is me coming up to you and asking if I can borrow a dime out of your pocket or a pencil or your hat. Um, the core electrons are, can I borrow your liver? Can I borrow your rib? Can I borrow your appendix? Well, I can get those things. The amount of effort that it takes to remove those from you is significantly higher. And here's that in number form. This number is significantly higher than this one and this one. And here we have a nice little table that shows sort of these ionization energies. So the first ionization energy of sodium is relatively low. The second ionization energy of sodium is almost 10 times as much, 9 times as much, which means that 
you know, the second ionization energy of sodium is removing that first core electron. Magnesium again, 738, 1450, 730, huge. Aluminum has three valence electrons. There's the first one, the second one, and the third one. Still, a, you know, 2700 is nothing to sneeze at in terms of a magnitude of an ionization energy. It's still quite a bit, but nothing compared to the amount of energy needed to remove that fourth electron. Again, this would be the first core electron, and that's 11,600. And for silicon, again, just for comparison, removing the first four is going to be relatively easy. And you can bet dollars to donuts that the number that would go right here in this table, the fifth ionization energy of silicon, you could look it up if you want, is going to be uh, probably really, really freaky big.